Philippians, open your Bibles there if you haven't already. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. That's where we're at today. We have uh, three more messages in our study of Philippians, and then we're going to move to Daniel, last Sunday of February, our new series. Does anybody know what limbo is? You feel like you're in limbo sometimes? <laughs> limbo? Yeah. Well, one evening, Teresa and I were uh, in Jamaica on vacation, and one night we, we watched this native Jamaican do the limbo dance to our amazement. I mean, we were mesmerized, as were all the other tourists gathered around this guy at this resort who was practicing this thing. Uh, the limbo originated in Trinidad and became really popular in Trinidad and Tobago at, guess what, funerals. Yeah, it was a very popular funeral expression or practice where it started. And, you know, the idea is these dancers move under this bar that starts chest high, right? And, it, you know, it's on some, but something's holding it up or someone's holding it up. And then they just, they, you know, they got to go backwards under that thing. They have to do it, the whole thing, no matter how low they go, they can't use their hands. Hands got to be free. And they go like this, under it this way. And it just, they get lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. Well, the world record... There is a world record to this. Um, she set it twice. The world record is set by Shamika Charles. She's a native of Trinidad. She lives in New York. She was 18 when she set that world record at 8.5 inches. I think we have a, do we have a picture? There you go. 8.5 inches. Then she set another record by being the first person to do the limbo under a car. It's impressive, to say the least. Which, which Teresa and I were watching this. Now, by the way, she, she's, she's an interesting lady. She's been on America's Got Talent. She's been on the Today Show. I mean, this is a modern uh, record setting. She's been on media outlets throughout the world, famous for what she's done. Um, well, Teresa and I watched this man do it, and we were looking at it and go, this thing can't be more than 12 inches high. And it was lit on fire. And I don't know how many times he did. It got lower and lower, and the bottom one had, it couldn't have been more than 12 inches, and it's lit on fire. And what's amazing is when he comes out on the other side, as we watched him, he stands up. He doesn't use his hands from his position, stands straight up. And I thought, what stability he has. What amazing stability with his feet. And we're talking about spiritual stability in our passage today. R remember, let's back up a minute. Remember the situation of Paul and Philippi? Remember, Paul's not sitting under a coconut tree drinking a pina colada. This guy is in, he's, he's a prisoner of Rome. And the church and Paul are facing poverty, prison, persecution. It is threatening to distract them. There are false teachers who are seeking to enter the church, threatening to derail them. From what? From their focus on the gospel. I mean, God brought this church family together as he has this church family together for a primary purpose, for one major purpose, and that's what? To worship God and to what? Reach those who don't know the Lord and disciple them. And we disciple one another. That's our purpose, the purpose of our existence. He brought them together in fellowship, in, in a unity, in a family. And, and then, on top of all of that, there is a threat in the church of a split between a couple of ladies who aren't getting along. And all that's going on, and as it's going on, it is robbing them of their joy, which is why Paul scatters that joy over and over, and over. he's talking about that joy over and over and over again throughout the letter. Now, when Paul closes this letter, he's got some critical words of instructions for them as they are to be focused on the gospel and upon their fellowship. So let's, let's look at this passage together. Uh, would you stand in honor of God's word? It is, I'm going to back up and read verses 1 through 9. Now today's focus is the second half of the passage. Um, and that's what we're going to look at. And the main idea is found in verse 1. So why we're going to back up and cover it. It is to stand firm. Stand with stability. Therefore, brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eodia and I entreat uh, Sintichi to agree in the Lord. By the way, if you're listening last week, 
Pastor Sam pronounced, that, pronounced her name Syntyche. It just depends on what seminary you went to. All right? Man, <laughs> tomato, tomato. <clears throat> so don't get hung up on that one. So here we go. So what does he say to do? He says, yes, and I ask you. To, he says, I entreat them to agree in the Lord, and I ask you, to, true companion, help these women who've labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That word reasonableness, as we studied, also means gentleness. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. And that's where we stopped in the first message on the passage. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And you may be seated. So the main verb the main verse that all the rest of this passage is built upon is the first one. And that main verb, that main phrase is to stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord. It's an imperative command. right? It's, it's do this. It's a command to you from Paul. Really, it's from the Lord through the Apostle Paul by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, and it means, it's a military word that's like holding the line in the heat of battle. So when the, when the battle is raging, stand firm, hold your ground, hold the line. That's what he's saying to do. And, God, it, and it means to have spiritual stability, to stand firm. No matter the trials, no matter the temptations, no matter what happens, keep your fellowship centered on having a secure mind, which is trusting Christ. And we've been studying this unity that we have in fellowship, symbolized by our tree knot, because the knot in a tree is so hard to divide to divide because it has these fibers, you know, interwoven together. It's difficult. I'm in that stage of the year where I'm cutting wood like crazy. I have a wood stove, and I like to cut my wood a year in advance, and I like to do it when it's cold. So I'm, I'm getting after it, and I'm in burning wood, and so we're splitting it, and we, Dad and I come to those tree knots, and we're thankful we have a hydraulic splitter. Amen? Because when I was a kid, we didn't have one, and I had that. You know what I mean. Nevertheless, we're thankful. It's so hard to divide. And Paul says these fibers, he gives us, there, there's more than that, but he gives us four of them in this passage that we've been studying. We're on the last one symbolized by our safe setting on that stage, and that is security, and it's a, it means a secure mind. We have a secure mind, which that security of mind is trusting Christ. That security of my mind is found in the Lord, trusting Him. That's where we're at. So as Paul wraps this, this, this thing up, he is saying we are to stand firm. He's giving some practical words of instruction. How? Well, notice this. He says stand firm in the Lord. Our relationship with Christ is the key to our stability. Where we're at with the Lord, our relationship with Him, He's the key to our stability. But then look, He also gives us some practical areas to, to do that in, to stand firm in. Not only are these areas that we're to stand firm in, as we practice these things, we will strengthen that stability. That word thus, or in verse 1, or in this manner, means in this way. In other words, here's how you do it. And that's what we're looking at, these practical areas. Two weeks ago, we examined in detail the first four. You remember, they, remember those? Cultivate harmony in the fellowship was the first one. So we walked through the passage. We know what cultivate means, right? What cultivating is. You, you don't just hope it happens. You, you work at it. Right? You, till, you dig the soil, you plant the seed, you cultivate this thing. You, you, you give your energy and your compassion and, and, and your touch to it, if you will. You work on it. So we cultivate harmony in the fellowship, number one. Number two, we, we cultivate joy in the fellowship. How we stand firm is, is what? Harmony, joy. And then the third one was gentleness. In the fellowship, the fourth one was cultivate faith in the Lord in our fellowship. We're, that we, we, that's the center of the passage, verse 5. And then uh, we're going to move to the next three. Last week, Sam did a, a, a wonderful, very practicable job of, in summary, walking through all seven of them. 
there are seven. There's three more we're going to cover in detail today. And, and, I, and wasn't that a beautiful service last week? Wasn't I just, if you were here, just amazing service. And, and then to take this ama- amazing timing of God to d- have direct these messages we planned, I don't know how far in advance, not knowing what date they'll fall on, to be on this day to talk about how the church and, uh, is, is, is ordaining and Mark and commissioning him for ministry, if you would. He's already been doing it, but to acknowledge that. And then to talk about how that works in our practical life and in the church. And Pastor Sam did a marvelous job doing that. Well, today we're going to dig deeper into those last three. So we've had the first four in detail. We've had all seven summarized. Now let's look at the last three. Prayerful thanksgiving, positive thinking, and obedient practice. Cultivate prayerful thanksgiving. What, what do you normally do when things turn difficult? Just think about it. I mean, don't answer out loud, but just think about it. When things get hard, when things get challenging, what do you normally do? Do we sit and worry about it? You know what that looks like, right? That looks like thinking through our circumstances a hundred different ways and times. You sit and you go over this in your head, over, when you're worrying, when you're anxious, you go over this over and over and over and over again, trying to look at every possible outcome. And you know what that causes, right? Withdrawal, cowardice, depression, discouragement, unwise decision making. It could cause outbursts of anger, wrath, gossip. It can cause all kinds of stuff when we practice those. It even causes physical sickness when we do that. Or, or do we try to scheme a way to resolve it through our human ingenuity and ability? I've got to figure out how to fix it. Do you know what that leads to, right? More worry about how you tried to fix it because you didn't fix it. <laughs> And so that leads to someone who's even more unstable and riddled with anxiety. Well, let's, let's park here. We're in the center of this passage. It's, it's a hinge, if you will. The Lord is at hand. Uh, we talked about verse 5 is, is interesting because you have, in most translations, you have the end of a sentence and then the beginning of a sentence that continues in the next verse. That is because in the original language there was no punctuation, and so our translators didn't know where it goes. Does it go with the previous thought, or does it go with the, con- the thought afterwards? I think it goes with every thought. It's right in this, this the Lord is at hand, is in the center of the passage, which means that he's either coming soon, it could, either, it could mean that, or he's very near us now by his presence through the Holy Spirit, and both are true, so that impacts everything in this passage. The Lord is at hand, the Scripture says, so do not be anxious about anything, or do not worry about anything, but do this instead. Prayer for Thanksgiving. What is worry or anxiety? Which is pretty much one and the same. What is worry or anxiety? Theologian John Piper says, Anxiety seems to be an intense desire for something accompanied by a fear of the consequences of not receiving it. Sound, sound about right? I think that's a good definition. Here is here's a more simplistic definition maybe and that is worry is imagining a future in a terrible way is it not you think about what you are worried about is something in the future that's bad or could be bad it's imagining a future in a terrible way John Ortberg said in a sermon once that worry is like carrying around an alarm clock all day about ready to go off can you imagine that kind of day? Always, oh, I hate that thing when it goes off in the morning. Amen? I don't know about you, but I am. And, and, and I don't like it. I mean, and now it's on my phone. I mean, oh, at least the other one I can throw against the wall. I throw the phone against the wall. It's a thousand bucks. <laughs> People become anxious and fearful because, listen, because they don't trust God's wisdom and power. Well, first of all, let's back up. People become fearful if they don't know God's wisdom and power. Those who do not have a a relationship with God don't know God. They don't know his wisdom. They don't know his power. Have no ability to rest or trust in him. And that would be obvious. 
So an, 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 atheist, an atheistic practice, has got, it, it leaves you with one alternative, and that is you've got to fix it and do it yourself. And since you can't control anything and everything or the outcomes of anything, you can't even know what they are, much less what to do about them, then we are riddled with anxiety and worry and fear. But listen, for the believer when we're worried, what we are actually practicing, though we do not realize it, is functional atheism. So we're not an atheist, but we're functioning as one when we're worried. What, what do you mean by that? We're living as though God doesn't exist and will not fulfill His promises. Even though we know there's a God, we know He's made promises, we're not living as though we know there's a God and He'll fulfill His promises. And He has, a, listen, He has not promised that we won't have trouble. He actually promised we would. John MacArthur says, the real challenge of the Christian life is not to eliminate every unpleasant circumstance. It is to trust in the good purpose of our infinite, holy, sovereign, powerful God in every difficulty or circumstance. Hasn't he made us many promises? Well, hasn't he promised to never leave us? Let's think about it. Functional atheism is living though God doesn't exist and won't fulfill his promises. Has God not promised he will never leave us? Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, but if he was with me, I wouldn't be going through this. Remember, he didn't promise we wouldn't have difficulty. What he promised is that he would not leave us, but would walk through us even through the valley of the shadow of death. No matter what we go through, he promised he would be with us. So we are not alone. He is always present. Hasn't God promised to provide everything we need? Philippians 4.19. One we'll get into more detail later in our study. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Yes, but I don't have that and I don't have this. And I mean, you could just list something you don't have that you think you have. Listen, God says there's a difference between needs and wants. And we have difficulty judging the difference often because we're not all-knowing. We don't have the mind of God or understand the things of God. He promised he would provide our needs. We are incapable of sometimes even knowing what those are. Hasn't God promised that everything that happens he will turn out for our good? Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. First of all, let me back up and tell you this promise has a condition. It is not for everyone. God did not promise this to everyone. Do you see the condition within it? It is only promised to those who what? Yeah, to those who love God. So, I mean, and only ultimately you and God know that. We, we, if, you're, if you love God, and then you're thinking, oh, well, this bad thing happened, I must not love him. <laughs> Remember, he didn't promise bad things won't happen. So, first of all, this is conditioned by giving to those who love him. It, it, but, but this bad thing happened. What does the text say? How many things? All things. Is that good things? Is that bad things? Yeah, so he says, oh, he didn't promise bad things won't happen. He promised that he would take all things and turn them to good. Why is it not happening now? Do you see any time constraints on this verse? Our timing and God's timing is just about as different as our wants and our needs and his and our wants. You know what I'm saying? Our understanding of various things. I don't know when. He didn't give us a time. But how many circumstances can you look at besides the one you're currently worried about? that you can look at in the past and see how he fulfilled it in his perfect time. And this one thing we know as believers is that God will fix it. He will take care of it someday. And someday may be that day. And it'll be fixed, but he'll take care of it. Haven't you read the end of the book? By the end of this year you will if you stay faithful to reading through the Bible as Sam's challenge us to do. At the end of the book he fixes it. Many things he even fixes here. He's promised those things. Instead, we worry. Matthew 6, 27, Jesus says, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? 
Some of you would acknowledge you can't even add a single hair to your head. Or you would have done it already. <laughs> if you can't add a hair to your head, how are you going to add an hour to your life? You know what worrying is like? Worrying is like a, worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it never gets you anywhere. Paul says the remedy for anxiety, the remedy for worry and fear is, in this verse, we, he, he gives the explanation, it's prayerful thanksgiving. And you see these repeated ter terms. You see prayer, you see supplication, you see requests. In this passage, they're all just synonyms. They're all synonyms. They're not meant to define a specific different type as much as they are just this. We take everything we have and give it to Him. We bring our petitions. We bring our requests. We bring our prayers to the Lord. God already knows what they are. He's not unknowing. It's not because we have to inform Him because He's missed something. He already knows it, but yet He calls on us to bring them to, to, bring them to Him because when we bring them to Him, we are casting all our cares upon Him. We are casting our worries on Him. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Because He what? He cares. So the Lord's saying, I know what they are, but talk to me about it. Open it up. Give it to me. Let's get it off your chest and put it on mine. I can handle it. You can't. Adrian Rogers once said, Thanksgiving is the highest expression of faith. Worry is perhaps the greatest expression of unbelief. We bring them to him in faith. Remember the center term in the middle of the passage back to verse 1, the Lord is at hand, the Lord is at near. That the Lord is near. It's the center of the text. So when we bring them to him, we are trusting him. And, and, and Paul says we, we do that with thanksgiving. We pray. Did you, get, did you catch that? It's not that we just pray. It's not that we cast all these things on Him. It's not just that we, 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 we unload on the Lord, and we do and we should, even if it's in tears, but we, there's a qualification. Did you catch it? We do it with thanksgiving. We do it with thanksgiving. Why? Because we know His promises. We know He never leaves us. We know He'll work all things out for, for good in the end. Because we know those things, we can be thankful for what He has already done for us. We can be thankful for what He has promised us. And we can be thankful for what He is going to do, even if we don't know what it is. In us, around us, through us. And when we do that, when we pray with, here's the caveat, thanksgiving. Often we're praying, but not with thanksgiving. When we do that, what does he say happens? May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace guards our hearts and minds. Paul, used, Paul stay in with his, his imagery, and he uses the word guard, which is another military term. So we talked about standing firm in the line of battle, right? Spiritual stability, hold the line no matter what comes at us, trusting in the Lord. We hold the line, we trust the Lord. Why? Because His peace is guarding us like armor. Only it guards the, the most center part of us. It is a peace that human insight and ingenuity cannot, divide, cannot devise. Just, that's what it means when it says it's a peace that passes understanding. It means human ingenuity can't come up with it. We can't even fully define it. We just have it. We, we've, we've got it. It protects our inner being. It's a transcendent calm that, that is over us no matter what the trials are. It doesn't make problems go away. It's a peace that gives power to meet the problems. I read of a missionary who was in the jungles of Africa and there was this lion that was threatening his life and so much there was nothing he could do about it other than pray. And he was terrified this lion was going to ravish him, if you will. And he, what, he, he did. He casted that prayer on God, believed and trusted God could take care of it, asked God to remove him from the jaws and the mouth of that lion, and God did. 
And then he went to bed that night, and all night long he was miserable. Do you know why? Because there was a mosquito hovering above his head. And when he woke up the next morning, the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart and said, you trusted God to take care of you from the lion and protect you from the lion, but you thought you could handle the mosquito all by yourself, didn't you? Folks, we cast all of our cares upon the Lord, big and small. All of them. Prayerful thanksgiving. Number two, verse eight, cultivate positive thinking. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, when we get to all those, lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Think on these things. You know, the human brain is a really scientific wonder. I mean, mean it is. We're still working on medically and scientifically understanding it even in 2023. Here's what we know. We know it has 12 to 14 billion billion cells and that is only a shadow of its complexity because each one of those cells sends out thousands of connecting tendrils so that one single cell in your brain can be connected to 10,000 other cells constantly exchanging information those 12 to 14 billion brain cells times 10,000 connectors make the human brain an unparalleled computer The mind's activity has been compared to 1,000 switchboards, each with the ability to run New York City at full capacity, constantly exchanging information and ordering commands. Just one of those. There, put another way, there is more electronic equivalent in one human brain than in all the radio and television stations in the world combined. It has the capacity, even more so, to imagine a universe that bends time. It has the ability to create polyphonic textures like Bach and Beethoven and to transmit and receive messages from God, and no computer will ever do that. Ever. I know what some of you are thinking. I'm missing a few of those cells. Or at least somebody I know next to me is. (laughs) Or somebody I work with. But you think, don't you? No matter how many actual cells you have, you still think. Paul didn't make this overly complicated. You think, and what we think, what you think is what you become. Where we have kept our minds is where we are. What happens is our our thoughts shape our behavior. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks within himself, so is he. I mean, think about this for just a minute. You know someone with a critical spirit who often expresses critical words. How do you know they have a critical spirit? Because they often express critical words, but you can see it on their face. Or, or complaining, someone who's complaining all the time about this, that, or the other. What is that, what is that critical thinking? Re- How do you know? Because they complain all the time. Everything in us works from the inside out. So someone who is critical all the time or is complaining all the time, you follow me, right? Where you put your mind, what you think about all the time, you act on. So our culture pursues emotion and pragmatism. Does it not? Think about that for a minute. Our culture pursues in life emotion and pragmatism. Instead of asking the question, is it true, we are tempted to ask, does it work and how does it make me feel? So we try to base our direction in life on how to, whether or not it works and how it makes me feel rather than whether or not it's true. What you think on is how you act. And that is why our world is full of anxiety and fear because too often it, it is those, because those things are built on unstable, ever-changing circumstances. If it's 
whether or not it works or how it makes me feel, that stuff changes all the time. And since those, change, those circumstances change over and over again, then one who is building their life and direction on that is going to constantly worry and be in fear because it's ever-changing. You still with me? Now let's take it to church. Some people come to church too often, not for biblical truth, but for a spiritual high. And when that happens, those folks will be spiritually unstable because their foundation is built on feeling rather than truth. Bill Hulse writes this, he says, What scares me is the anti-intellectual, anti-critical thinking philosophy that has spilled over into the church. This philosophy tends to romanticize the faith, making the local church into an experience center. Their concept of, quote, church is that they are spiritual consumers and it's the church's job to meet their felt needs. So, in in the dangerous side, the far-leaning Charismatic movement, for example, is driven by feeling and therefore has no depth. On the flip side, the the far-leaning fundamentalist movement is built on legalism and has no heart. The way it's supposed to work is my spiritual foundation is built on truth that can express feeling in various ways. But the foundation is truth. Salvation begins with an understanding of the basic truths of the gospel. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes from the message about Christ. The message about Christ, that he is the Son of God, who came, virgin born, to step into our place, if you will, and live a sinless life, who even in his sinlessness was crucified, executed for our sins, yet rose from the dead after three days and exalted to the name above every name and position above every position through which no one can come to the Father except through a relationship with Jesus by faith. The truths of the gospel. But then our faith grows on biblical truth. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the what? Not the way you feel, though your feelings may change, but change the way you think. My feelings change with what I ate last night. Hello? I mean, don't, dis- don't, don't misunderstand me. Don't, mis- don't dismiss them. We-, we need to be a church that feels. But the feeling needs to be built on truth. Sometimes feelings deceive you. So I always check my feelings with truth. And the truth's in the book. God doesn't accept worship that's performed in ignorance. Did you know that? God does not accept worship that is performed in ignorance. Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. So God's word in our passage lists six realities that believers must focus their thinking on. I'll run through these kind of quickly. But what are these six realities? What is, he says, so think on these things. Here's what you focus your thinking on. What's true? It begins here. That's referring to the Lord in his word because we know Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them, praying to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. So that's, this is the big one. This is where you start. We also know in John 14, 6 that Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So God's word is truth. And that truth became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's the foundation piece. What is honorable, it means dignified, worthy of respect. What is just means righteous, or what is right, what's in harmony with God's standard, not the world's standard, what God says is the standard. What is pure means holy or morally clean. 
What is lovely means gracious, generous. It's something that would cause us to think the way God thinks. What is commendable, that's the kind of conduct that God speaks highly of, and so do those who follow him. And then he summarizes them by stating whatever is morally excellent and worthy of praise. Those last two are just a summary of the previous. Now, if we look at what we dwell our thinking on, and compare that to what the unbelieving world dwells its thinking on, is there any difference? Because whatever you fill your mind with is what you will dwell on, and that will be what you act on. So, think about what's true, not what's false. Let's just make it practical. Think about what's honorable, not dishonorable. Think about what's Just, not unjust. What's lovely, not repulsive. You follow me? And those things aren't just found in the the Word. They're also found in the world. God's creation is full of those things too. He's got all kinds of good things we can think about. Music, art, family, plants, animals, even sports. Yeah, even sports. (laughs) Provided we focus on those things in the area that God gives honor to. When those things fulfill that list we just read through. Number three. Let's let's begin to wrap it up here. He says, this is verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. The simple call here is practice what you learn. First and foremost from the book. Don't just be a hearer, but be a doer of those things. And that word practice, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, whatever term yours may use, it may just use the word do. But the word in the original language means a lifestyle. It, practice means, if you do practice, right, it means you do it over and over and over and over and over again. It describes a continuous action. Make this a lifestyle. What's it mean to make a lifestyle? Think on these things as a lifestyle. In fact, all of the previous things, make a lifestyle, all seven of them. Cultivate obedient practice in all of those areas. Paul wasn't, now now yes, he says, so what you've seen and heard in me. Paul wasn't perfect, but he was a great pattern to follow. And so he wants them to do the same thing. When I'm following these things, I'm setting an example for you. Learn from me. And when I'm not, don't. (laughs) That's what he's talking about. That was the reason for the apostles. This is awesome. We, we We see Jesus in his life, and we want to follow. He's the perfect example, right? And then through the apostles and the life of the apostles described in the New Testament... After the resurrection, we don't have perfect people, but we have people striving to follow Christ that we can look at. And we, can, and we see, if you're a believer and you're trusting His Word, you put that first, you go, oops, he messed up. But, but, but it's amazing and wonderful in the life of those apostles when you see them get it right. And what I mean by that is when they messed up and then, then get it right. When they make course corrections. Sometimes we don't get to see all of the details. But for example, you remember when Paul and Barnabas got in a big argument and split a mission team? You know who they were arguing over or what they were arguing about? They were arguing over Mark, John Mark. God got a lot of things right through that division and through those things. God winds up sending John Mark to Peter who writes the Gospel of Mark, Peter's account of the New Testament. And not only that, when Paul's on his deathbed, you know who he asked to see? Bring to me because I need him. Mark. Isn't it wonderful when you see them when they mess up, they get things right? Last week, Sam said, in reference to this one, that there are both current and historical examples to look at. And he's right. I love to look at historical examples, but there's a lot of current examples. Folks, I'm learning from you. I'm always learning from Sam. I learn how to dress from Sam. I learned how to have Justin Rich add a picture to a PowerPoint the morning of the sermon. 
I called them this morning. I called Justin. He says, you sound like Sam. <laughs> I said, I said, well, I said last week I couldn't feel his shoes, but I could follow in his steps. I learned a lot of wonderful, powerful things from Sam. And this week I had a powerful moment with just some time with Coach in his office learning some things from him. And last night I was invited to a fellowship among church members and sitting across, I was learning. Sitting across from me was a couple who were from polar opposite ends of the world. I mean, it's different as night and day. And you know when I was watching and learning from Pee Wee and Curly, how God can take those historical backgrounds and bring them together in unity full of grace because they're so different. And setting off just off to my left was a, a man who's been through wars and, and um, amazing things in the military year in and a year out and, and has seen the combat of the world and I saw from Dave joy. He never ceases to express joy no matter what he's doing. And just to my left were the Warners, and I thought, I'm sitting next to them, who are in the midst right now, tonight, in the midst of a, a family tragedy and struggle, and they were just filled with God's peace. I was learning. I was learning. Folks, <clears throat> when you stop learning from others, you stop learning, and you will stop growing, and you will stop leading. Be a lifelong learner. Never stop. It's amazing who God can use to teach you. When the disciples looked at the crowds and had no idea how in the world they were going to do it, God used a little boy to teach those disciples how he could multiply fish and bread. The Christian life is a discipline of faith and of faithful living. And the scripture says God's peace and presence enable us to do it and comfort us. It's when we seek these things, then God plants his peace on us. Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Are there any bowlers in the house? Anybody bowl? How many of you bowl? They're scattered around. There's a handful of bowlers. This is not one of my favorite sports. It's just not. It's not very high on my list. But I like to play it with others because it's fun to watch other amateurs like me. I mean, it really is. I was reading a commentary on this particular passage and theologian Tony and Pastor Tony Morita actually said, he says, bowling is very, he's used that as to describe or to illustrate this passage. And, and, and what he was getting at is he, when someone releases the ball who's an amateur, and you're watching, that's why it's so fun. When they release the ball, it's amazing what they will do with their bodies. Right? You with me? I mean, they'll tiptoe to the left. They'll, 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 they'll slide backwards. They'll, they'll, they'll contort themselves in every shape possible. And some of them talk to the ball. Come on, you can do it. Go to the left, go to the left, go to the left. It's hilarious. It's like going to Walmart and just sitting on a bench. <laughs> it's amazing what you'll see. Full entertainment. Full day is entertainment. Just go sit outside Walmart. <clears throat> Here's what Tony says. It's true. No matter what you do, nothing you can say or do once you release the ball, will change where the ball goes. Once your fingers leave the ball, there's nothing you can do to change where it's headed. Listen, worry won't change anything either. What we have to do is to practice what the Word of God we've been studying tells us to practice and let God have the results. Let God direct it. Think on the right things. Give God thanks for the good things that he has given you and will give you, and then let him deal with it. Easier said than done, but that's what he tells us to do. That's the key. That's the key to stamping out worry. Do what he tells you to practice, and then leave the results to him. 
you can't affect it anyway. Remember what we said a couple weeks ago, interest is payment on a debt that you don't owe. That's what worry is. Worry is paying on paying the interest on a debt that you don't owe. Leave it to him. Last time I checked, Jesus already paid our debt. He don't owe anything. Let's pray together. I would invite you if you are in the condition, as we mentioned this morning, earlier about the halfway through the passage, the centerpiece, right, is your relationship with the Lord. If you don't know Him or His power or His presence, you can, and I want to invite you to seek Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. And now you do that with a decision. It's just simply acknowledging that you need Him, that you are accountable to Him, that He paid your debt on a cross, rose from the dead, and is your only hope. And by faith, you, you say, I need you, Lord, to change me. I can't change. I want to live for you. Don't know what that looks like, but from this point forward, I surrender it all to you. Change me. Secure my home in heaven and change me while I'm on earth. I can't do it. That's the essence of salvation. I want to follow you in your steps, Lord. I want to, I want to live life the way you direct me. I just don't know how and can't without you, so I want to begin today. That's a simple decision in a prayer you can ask him for. Believer, what can you do with worry? Let's not live as functional atheists, shall we? Let's just turn it over to him. What, what do you got on your what you got on your heart? What's on your mind? Give it, cast it to him. Then let the, him have the results. And by the way, when the devil tempts you to pick it back up again tomorrow, cast it back at his feet again. It's amazing. Sometimes you have to do it over and over and over. Because I have to tell the Lord, Lord, I picked this back up but at least I know where to go with it. Give it right back to you. Father, we take this morning and thank you, Lord, for this time of worship and this time in your word. We thank you for these powerful truths that are meant to fill us with joy, to keep us held together as a family in unity to give us spiritual stability to stand against the trials and the depravity of the culture that surrounds us. You've not promised that you would remove any of those things yet, but that one day you will. And until you remove them all, you have promised to never leave us. You've promised to provide all our needs and that in some way and in some time, because we love you and more importantly, we love you because you loved us, you will turn them out for our good. Help us to practice the claim of these promises. Help us to set our thoughts and our minds on those things which are ultimately worthy of praise, which are ultimately, Lord, honorable. And those things are found not only in your word, Lord, but even in the world when they honor you. Help us to practice those things. Help us to keep our thoughts ultimately focused on you because therein and therein alone is where we find our perfect peace. Lord, once again, Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Help us trust in you. Give it to you and let you handle it. In Jesus' holy, wonderful name we pray.